Thank you very much, and thank you very much to, to Prof who was speaking before me. I've been trying to remember your name, but I, I've also haven't had enough sleep, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to say Prof for now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that I'll be able to answer some of those questions and frustrations that, that, that you have. Um, I was asked to speak on the national roadmap, but I would have rather have been speaking on how the hound of academia is finally learning to wag the tail of the scholarly publishing rather than the other way around. And that's, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog that's really happy to see you. Have you? But the whole body moves and it looks as though the tail is actually swinging the dog. So I, I think that's what's happened is that publishers have got hold of academia and are just saying, give me all your money. And they're shaking us dry. And um, the other reason for this slide is because it's, I can tell you my favorite joke. Um, and I have my wife's permission to do so. Um, I know that some of you think that a, a dog is your best friend. Is that right? Well, if you are in any doubt, what I suggest you do is you lock your wife and your dog in the boot of the car for three hours. And then when you go there and open up again, tell me who is happier to see you. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Uh, straight away, if, um, uh, again, Prof, I'm so grateful that you spoke before me, because why is it that the whole of the University of California that produces 10% of America's research, why is it that Canada, why is it that the whole of Europe, why is it that China, etc., 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 are going the open access route? Do you think that it's because they feel sorry for the poor global south who can't afford the subscriptions? Why? It's because they've obviously worked out, and they say it unashamedly, that it helps them to innovate and therefore be world leaders. It's quite simply that reason. So why is it that we want to now find another reason to get further behind? instead of getting on this bandwagon. So I've shown you this slide that I saw um, from Alan Gray. Uh, by the way, I'm a huge advocate of open access. I'll borrow slides from anywhere and everywhere. But this, whoopsie, this shows you that our population, well, you've got two populations there. On the right, you've got the United Kingdom. On the left, you've got South Africa. Similar populations. How many? Of those, 60-odd million people are working. Well, in the United Kingdom, it's more than 30 million. In South Africa, it's close on 10 million are working. How many, now we're looking at the red bar, of the United Kingdom pay tax? Well, that's also a little bit higher than 30 million. How many in South Africa are paying tax? Well, it's closer to 5 to 7 million people are paying tax. Then we're going to try and use that tax money to spend it on Estina Dairy, I mean, on education <laughs> and uh, research and APC charges, am I right? So we're already in such a disadvantaged situation. Can we afford to waste any money? All right, so everybody has said everything I needed to say before. So I can, if I'm spending more than five seconds on a slide, so please tell me to move on. Right, so this, this graph shows you how open access has been trying to get going for the last 15 odd years and hasn't really got better than about, depending on whose stats you look at, between 20 and 25% of research output is currently open access. One of the reasons, as you know from the previous speaker, is that institutions are not providing the money. There are many other reasons, the main reason being reputation. Am I right? You, you heard from, from the gentleman from Plan S. You want to publish in Nature because then you're going to get the job you want and everybody's going to come and cite you. So <clears throat> when you do see the, the transition, you'll notice that the growth area is in the hybrid rather than in the gold open access. So in a way, gold open access had kind of stalled. And that is why Plan S and Open Access 2020 began to take off. And um, again, it depends on which stats you use. The, um, 
from this 08 2020 slide, they're arguing that only 18% is open access and the rest is behind a paywall. And that each square there represents 1% of the world's research output. And the blue, light blue, re re refers to Elsevier, the publisher, Springer Nature, you heard it mentioned before. The top five make up at least 55% of the world's research output. So it makes sense to have a closer look at these big deals that we've got tangled into and ask ourselves, if we are going to transform anything, that's perhaps where we're going to get some traction. So this whole discussion is about two crucial issues. The one is access to scholarly information. If you can't read what's already been researched, you're already on the back foot. You're already behind, right? So it's obvious that a national imperative is to make sure that we can have access to everything. Am I right? Anybody disagree with me at this stage? Right. The second imperative is to cut the costs, to have affordable access. And that is why these national licenses didn't last very long, because they weren't affordable. And that's why our own national site licensing initiative didn't uh, really get off, get off the ground on the road. <clears throat> These slides will be left with you and you're welcome to interact with me, but this, th the next few slides simply describes the steps and the sort of key milestones along the road. Um, so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. It's, it's, sh suffice to say that we were initially looking at a national site licensing project to try and get every institution signed up to the lion's share of the resources. To be quite honest with you, I think they already signed up to the lion's share of the resources in terms of read access, paying subscriptions. Um, there are very few who aren't. Um, but that soon morphed into a, a question of, well, what about Open Access 2020 because of all the things that has already been discussed? And I think uh, Prof. Bauer has already mentioned the Berlin 14 conference in December 2018. Uh, there's a picture of all the participants. Um, Prof. Bauer is on the extreme left. And in that bottom picture, you can see him telling off the CEO of Wiley about the democratization of knowledge. That was a, such a fantastic moment, I can tell you what. But out of that declaration came some certain key issues. And again, Prof, thank you for speaking, because we're talking about the rights of the institutions who generate the knowledge and the rights of the researchers. And you'll notice that the first thing on their list that came out of that declaration was, we want to maintain our copyrights. It's our, after all our knowledge. It doesn't belong to the publishers. Why do you have to give your money to the tail so that you can publish your research when they're just such a... It's like saying, you've got such a nice envelope. I'll tell you what, I'll give you all the, the, the rights to what's inside the envelope. It's nonsense. And so um, I'm getting so excited about this, so I'm forgetting why, <laughs> what else I needed to tell you about this slide. So I think that at that conference, it was also fantastic. After Prof. Bauer, you, there was a guy from China uh, I don't think that's him there. I think he was on the extreme right. He then said, as Prof. Bauer said, you know, I represent 20% of the research. You know? And so I think the publishers actually stood up and paid attention um, in a big way, and I'll explain why. So we worked out in South Africa that we've got to concentrate on seven things. We've got to have meetings where we get together and make sure we're on the same page and we understand the same things when we talk about open access or transformation or whatever. Um, we need to maintain our relationship with the people who are driving the Open Access 2020 initiative. Data collection, I'm afraid I'll keep emphasizing it till the cows come home. We can't just have an overall picture. The devil is in the detail. Um, we've got to come up with a governance model because really what we're asking is we're asking all members who are currently paying subscriptions Please keep that money so that we can now use it to pay all the, the, the open access fees so that all, all of our researchers can, pay, uh, can do open access publishing. Now, if one institution says, ah, I don't really want to pay my subscription fee over to you so that 
you know, but we're, we're not really using it for our APCs, but I don't want to give it to you so you can carry on publishing open access. You know, you're going to run into a problem. So we need a governance model. We need a way of re-looking at the workflows. We need a way of saying the way the state subsidy comes out has to support research. At the moment, it's supporting all the wrong things, isn't it? You know, at the moment, you just got to put out papers there, don't you? Rather than put out quality papers that are going to make a difference, right? So we've got to look at that, and we've got to look at how we're going to put the national spend together in a way that suits the laws of the country and suits the, the stakeholders in the pot. We need champions at each institution. Uh, uh, while I was in Berlin uh, last month, or when was it, in October, um, um, one of the people from the University of California was a professor of pediatrics. And he was saying, when a librarian comes with a deck of slides and says, this is what we must do in open access, nobody listens. But when a researcher comes with exactly the same deck of slides and says to other researchers, this is what we've got to do, they say, yeah, let's do it. Right, so, so we need champions. Um, um, not only in research, not only from, from faculty, we need champions from the administration and we need champions in the library. So we've been discussing a roadmap and we had a meeting in June just after the Sandlick conference where we kind of made a little bit more progress about wh where it is that we need to go. I'm not going to break down into that detail right now. And, but one of the steps was that we, uh, we were going to produce a national declaration. And uh, Prof. Bauer launched that at the Higher Education Conference. I think it was, I forgot the date, I think it was the beginning of November or the end of October. Um, that's also included here, but it says pretty much what we've already said. So I'm not going to read it through for you. It'll be there for you to read and to support or to criticize or to comment on. But this, I suppose, is a document that can unify this nation. Instead of having each separate open access policy, we have one sort of clear picture of what it is that we want to achieve. So I'd encourage you as CUT and UFS to engage with it. Um, so there it is, there's the declaration. <clears throat> so um, Prof also introduced who is in the team. I'm not going to go over that again. Just say, safe to say that one of the first steps that we've done is we've broadened the negotiating team that negotiates for subscriptions. And already I've seen a, a difference by having uh, Professor Stephanie Burton who's, who was representing research for the country in, in a negotiation with Springer Nature. So this breakdown here is a breakdown of South Africa's research output by publisher. And again, each square represents a percent. So Elsevier, you can see 21% at the front. Then next up is Taylor and Francis then Springer Nature in red, and then Wiley in that sort of greeny blue color, and then Sage Publications in green, and then uh, it says ASAF, but uh, maybe Ina can help me unpack that a little bit more as to how that ended up as, as a publisher. Um, but it's probably the way that people wrote, wrote the addresses or whatever. It's probably mainly Cielo or only Cielo? Only Cielo. Okay, that's very interesting. I'm learning something new all the time. So, so there, I sub and, and that's all open access, right? Ina? Yeah. So there, there, there's a good chunk of our open access research output. So uh, uh, where I'm going to be concentrating is on those first five, for, for obvious reasons. So there was a stage where everybody thought the big deal was a fantastic idea. You're subscribing to one unit of journals, or it's of journals. The publisher comes to you and says, I'll tell you what, if you subscribe to all five units of, of journals that we've got in our, our stable, we'll only charge you for two units. So what did we do? We said, fantastic. We increased our value of our collections, and we were only paying double. The only problem is they put the price up on the double so much so 
that we suddenly didn't have money for all the other things we needed to subscribe to. Right? I mean, that's really what happened. So, <clears throat> um, and, and I suppose we can call that the cuckoo effect. So what is it that SANLEC does for, for our members? Every research in, uh, sorry, every university and six research institutions are members of SANLIC, and we negotiate on your behalf to, to uh, come up with better deals for subscriptions. And you'll notice that the, the, the dark line on the left represents the list price of all the journals that we negotiate um, added up year after year, and you'll notice how they are skyrocketing in price with the compound inflation on the price that the, the publishers want you to pay if you buy article by article. The blue area is what we actually save you every year. And that also goes up because the, it's attached to the list price. And the gold area is what you end up actually paying. So you'll notice that given fluctuations of exchange rates and given our ability to negotiate collectively by putting everybody's purchasing power together, we've been able to keep the price somewhere between 490 million and 560 million for this collection of, of journals. Uh, but that, you want to know, what do, what do we pay to read? Well, sir, that's what you pay to read. And that excludes all the journals that your library subscribes to outside of Sandlick and all the databases that your library subscribes to outside of Sandlick deals. So I would put that figure closer to add another 20, 30% to it. What are we talking there? Three fives of 15, uh, six, seven. Probably 750 million rand we're spending a year as a country on library subscriptions for databases and journals. I'm not including books. Right? <clears throat> so this looks fantastic. We're saving you 87%. Aren't you happy? Well, you can't pay your APC, so you're not happy, right? So <clears throat> if we break that down by, by member, and I've labeled CUT and, and UFS, you'll see what your cost avoidance is as compared to the rest of the Sandlick members and how many subscriptions you subscribe to through. Um, or products you subscribe to through Sandlick. If you want me to stop or come back to any of this, let's do it later, but I'm afraid I've got tons of information I want to share. This is the break, uh, previously I showed you the breakdown of where our research output, where our articles are happening. This here is a breakdown of the money that you spend through Sandlick with the various publishers. And you'll notice that Elsevier Science Direct takes a huge chunk and you'll see further down, Scopus is another 2% you need to add to that. So call it 30% for Elsevier alone. Wiley Journals Package 15, Springer Nature 9%, Taylor and Francis 8%, so on and so forth. So the top five deals account for 66% of our expenditure. Um, so, but that's, you know, I've got journal collections and databases in here, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> Elsevier's profits after tax, Prof. Bauer already mentioned it, but if you don't believe it, there's the graph. They are making, after they've paid tax, after they've invested in the next thing they're going to force you to buy from them, uh, that they've bought that used to be free for you, um, they still manage to get away with a profit of between 35 and 40 percent after tax. It is shocking. That is where your money is going. And if you don't believe me, Sweden cancelled Elsevier and announced how much they were paying for the same package you were paying for. Well, what were they paying? Sweden was paying 12 million euros, which you can translate into nearly 14 million US dollars. We were paying 10 million US dollars in the same year. For our members, which was, I think there were about 26 who were subscribing, um, their research output, 26,000 papers, of which 15,400 had a corresponding author. Corresponding author being the person who would have to pay the APC, right? We put out 12,000 papers in the same year in 2014, of which about 7,600 had a corresponding author from South Africa. They, 
the institutions who had read access were 38 universities and 128 academic research institutions. We had 26 universities and six relevant research institutions benefiting from read access. So we're effectively paying double what Sweden was paying. Don't tell me anything about, well, we feel sorry for the global south. Sorry, I don't buy that. And the thing that really gets me is that you pay your subscription every year. This graph shows you what you read as a nation every year. And you'll see that in, where are we, 2017, only 17% 17 of the downloads had to do with articles that were produced in 2017. The rest of the stuff is the stuff that you've already rented year after year after year after year after year. And when you cancel Elsevier, they say, that's it. No more read access, unless it's an historically subscribed title. That's why it's so hard to break away from that. But there are a whole lot of countries and institutions in the world that have started to break away and have done very nicely, thank you, without them, and have been able to use that money for better purposes. So what do we as Sanlek do? We go into these negotiations knowing that none of you are saying to us, if they don't agree to your price, cancel. Right? So now if I go into a negotiation, I say, I want a lower price, and they say, no, what must I say? OK, <laughs> give us your price. We'll pay it. But in spite of that, we've managed to keep knocking down the prices year after year, so that the, at least the compounded growth in those prices has been coming down. And this is a list of those top 65% of the expenditure, and you'll notice that m we've managed to get most of those below 5%. Um, so if you, want, if you don't like this picture, who doesn't like this picture? Who doesn't like the status quo here? I see your hand, sir. All right, so some of us don't like the idea of this. Some of us might be saying, well, are you tricking me? Are you not showing me the... I, I hope you challenge what I'm saying. But in order to change things, you need to break down the data into very careful detail, deal by deal, institution by institution, uh, discipline by discipline, to work out exactly what the implications are of any moves that you make and when you go into these negotiations of what you would do if you don't succeed. But um, this was already spoken about, but I think it's so important that about 2 million research articles every year cost about 7.6 billion euros, but which, would, which ends up being a cost of 3,800 euros per article. Do you have any idea what it costs us per article to have read access? Um, However, we do know that the average APC across all APCs in the world is 2,000 euros. So what happens if we flipped overnight? 2,000 euros times 2 million papers? Well, the good news is only 4 billion. So you've suddenly got a 45% buffer of money that could be used for something else if we were to move to a fully open access society. There's more than enough money in, this, in the system. The problem is that one per, a research-intensive institution will pay much more because they would be paying more article processing charges, and a teaching-intensive institution will pay much less, if anything. And yet the money at the moment is coming from evenly from everybody. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over these slides uh, except very quickly, and then, then the publishers got really wise. They knew that you wanted open access. So they said, OK, well, let's keep the subscriptions going. But those of you who want open access, let's open up the open access account on the side. And we just have a new revenue stream. Thank you very much. Let's keep going with the subscriptions. Thank you. Double dip. Thank you. Don't let anyone tell you there's no such thing as double dipping. If you do the maths, you realize um, it's true. Also, if open access is growing so fast, how come? are subscriptions still increasing in cost? They will tell you it's because there are more articles being produced behind the paywall than in open access. They're saying open access may be growing, but paywall articles are growing faster. Do you want to let that happen? 
This is just putting the same thing in, in a different graphic way, which I find uh, quite useful to, to understand. So that if you were to take all that subscription money that's in the system, and you were to move it to an open access model, you would have a whole lot of buffer. And this, this little graphic assumes that you've managed to convert 90% of the journals from, from uh, paywall to open access. Right, so what, I think that the, from the discussions I've had at each institution we visited, I, I've got the impression that a lot of people are very confused about what open access is and what it means to the researcher. And I see the professor at the back nodding, and I'm sure people will tell you, you go open access, you end up in predatory journal territory, and it's a, that might be the case for a, a very few journals, but really that is a sideshow. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about taking respected journals that are currently behind the paywall and forcing them to become open access and to maintain their reputation, to maintain their um, editors and their peer review panels and their reputation, but just do it in an open access way. So I tried to list the benefits I thought of and the pro disadvantages, and then Prof came and explained it to you that his research grant doesn't include the portion to pay for the publishing. Or does it? I don't know. But the, 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 the challenge is that all the money is locked into paying for subscriptions. So um, there's a lot of confusion. Um, I think I've, this has all been covered already. So, I don't, so this is what it looks like. Now, without Plan S, without Open Access 2020, without, I might add, um, green open access or institutional repositories and institutional journals. Um, but with them, suddenly, your researcher can continue to choose to publish wherever they wish, even if it's behind the paywall, in a, in a section that hasn't yet been flipped to open. You can let the researchers carry on doing what they need to do best for their profession whilst this transition takes place. Um, you create competition amongst publishers. And um, I've already mentioned there's more than enough money in the system. So you st it's more affordable, for crying out loud. So you can afford to put money into your own journals put money into your institutional repository, to put money into your article processing charges. Prof spoke a lot about scope three and using the preprint archive archive. Um, and scope three is about flipping high energy physics journals. It's made a huge impact, although it really is about only a handful of journals. 90% uh, of high energy physics happens in about 12 journals. The re and then there's a long, long tail of where the, the rest of the high energy physics publishing happens at. And these guys have managed to capture uh, the material, but they looked at the top four journals, two Springer and two Elsevier journals. And before those journals flipped to open access, the, the CERN, the, the high energy physics guys in Switzerland there, put the money up and force those journals to flip. This is what the picture looked like before they flipped. Everybody went and read this, the articles in archive that, that became available, the preprint version, um, six months before publication. You can see the actual numbers. After the date of publication, you can see the vertical red line. After the date of publication, did they all start reading behind the paywall? No siree, not for two years. There was continued to be more downloads from archive than from the, 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 the official, but everybody knew it was in the official journal, right? So after scope, you would have imagined that would have changed. Uh, after that journal flipped, and, and uh, the, the evidence shows that no, it didn't. Um, the actual journal doubled its readership, uh, doubled its downloads. The, the, the journal that used to be behaved paywall that became gold open access. But it didn't impact on the downloads from archive. In fact, the downloads from archive increased. So 
it's good for science, folks. It really is good for science. So, <clears throat> we've mentioned that there's several pathways to open access. And, and this is the most important piece. This, you can get this information from the ESAC website. That's where all transformative agreements are being loaded and described. So each one of those donuts represents a different country, usually through a consortium that has been negotiating transformative agreements. And um, the different colors represent the publisher with whom they have negotiated those transformative agreements. So what I need you to understand is that we, and I'm so interested to hear the Plan S gentlemen say that they are closing their window at the end of 2024 of funding, um, uh, you know, giving an ultimatum on funding, right? If, incidentally, besides the Department of Higher Education and Training, the bulk of the rest of our funding, our private funding, comes from Plan S funders. Uh, you may or may not know that but that's the truth. Um, so we, we need to move fast is the message, basically, because if we add our momentum to these guys, we can slip through. If we don't, and their transformative deal comes to an end, they're only going to benefit from their own open access and not ours. And, and our, we'll still be in the dark because no one will be reading our stuff. Right? So we've got to, you know, we've got to, I'm just, you know, it's just so important to join the party. On our website, we've got fantastic recordings, like what you'll have from today, but better in the sense that we had the University of California telling their story, and we had people from Germany telling their story, and explaining a lot of the detail, and a lot of the questions that we just can't answer in this short space of time. So I would encourage you to go to our website, go to our conference, and you can download the slides or you can watch the YouTube video of your choice. Um, but we have the roadmap of the University of California. We have a lot of wonderful resources from the University of California and from, um, well, across the world really, but uh, a lot from Open Access 2020, which is based mainly in Germany. And this is a very interesting resource. Delta Think started providing a service to publishers to help them keep track of what's going on. And this, this graphic uh, I just love because on the left, that is the number of articles that are open access. And you'll see that they put it somewhere, somewhere close to 30, you know, around 30% where the gold is gold open access, and the blue is the hybrid open access. Um, but the, the little short graphs on the right is the percentage of revenue that comes from that. So what is happening is that the publishers, although close on 30% of all articles are now open access, the revenue that the publishers are deriving from that is closer to 8%. What does that tell you? That tells me that if we flip, it's going to be cheaper. Right? It's, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. So, um, there, there are a whole lot of questions we have to answer, and we have to move very, very carefully. We can't just rush into this. We do have to unpack a whole lot of information. But what I want to do is, is, is we actually didn't know really how to start, and we were struggling to get going. And we got a lot of help from the University of California. They showed us how to do it. We said, okay, let's just start. We get, we've got Taylor and Francis in, interested in a transformative agreement with South Africa. Let's go. And we started downloading Taylor and Francis data. We gathered the data we got from Taylor and Francis, and we started comparing notes. And, and this is what we, we started discovering. This line represents all the research output from South Africa in Web of Science. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff that Web of Science excludes because their rules are quite stringent and a lot of South African journals just don't make it there. So that, that, 
So what we're trying to ask is, what happens if we had to pay 2,000 euros per article? Would it be more expensive or cheaper than subscribing and paying them on the side and having researchers frustrated? So what you first got to do is you've got to remember that we'll only pay for um, articles and reviews. So we had to eliminate all the other types of things like letters to the editors, et cetera, et cetera. So that number suddenly drops to the, the, the gold line. Then remember that you only pay when you have, have a corresponding author from your institution. That's the guy who pays. So we need to say, well, how many of those eligible articles have a corresponding author from one of our institutions? And that's what it looks like. So now we're getting closer to the thing. But now I, I only had data for 2019 fees that I could pull together without spending many, many hours on the work. So I then extrapolated and I said, well, given the trend and the slowing down of the research output, let's add that by 3% to get to a number for 2019. And then let's play with those numbers. This, you can look at this some other time, but that's all the detail that we were just unpacking there. So in this graph, the numbers on the left, the blue ones, are actual information from Scopus and Web of Science. The numbers on the right are, are me taking that information and putting estimates to it based on the available information I, I had at my fingertips. We've got information from Web of Science that they've described to us. We've got information uh, you know, arguing that, that South Africa is one of the best open access publishers in the world in terms of research output. Uh, Crest has suggested that our research output is above 30%, um, which is quite interesting. But where is it all going? Where, you know, where are we publishing all that open access research? And then you've got to be mindful that it, it varies from discipline to discipline. Incidentally, you could watch these on the YouTube videos from our conference. I'm just giving you a teaser, an advert. So we've got Clarivate telling us you publish 24% open access. We've got Crest telling us you publish between 33 and 35% open access. So what is it? What must we use to do the calculations? Well, you've got to drill down into the detail is the, short, is the long answer. The short answer is let's go with 30% and see what we come up with. So that, that's the, but then now we start looking at Taylor and Francis and we say, hold on, the, the like bits on the top, that's the open access publishing. It's only close to 8% in the Taylor and Francis stable. And they're saying to us, if we transform, do you realize when you pay APCs, you're going to pay more than your subscription? Uh, if you go with an average APC of 2,000 euros per article. And I did the maths and I realized they were right. And I said, but hold on, most of that's in... South African journals, uh, 2,000 euros is 34,000 rand. The highest open access APC for a South African journal is 11,000 rand. The average is 1,500 rand per article. Where are we going to get to those big numbers? There's no way. So what you've got to do is you've got to say, okay, what are we currently spending? That's the graph on the left. You've got subscriptions, you've got hybrid open access fees, and you've got pure gold open access fees. During a transition, you agree with the publisher that you're going to pay them the same money for three years. And during that period, you'll be able to publish everything open access, and you'll have all the read access you want, and they'll have all the money they're used to getting from you. Right? That's the transformative agreement. At the end of that transformative agreement, that's the thing on the right. You no longer pay for any subscription fees. You only pay pure open access, and you only publish pure open access. Right? So what will that mean from a money point of view? I did the maths, but when I try and show you the slide, it looks really, really messy and confusing. The bottom line is we're currently paying about 717 million for what I was calculating. And if we went to open access, we'd only pay 538 million, which is 25% less that we could have in our institutions. That's the big picture. But you actually want to break that down. And that is using an assumption of a 34,000 rand per article, article processing charge. I'm telling you, because so much more is in open access already, um, 
we will be able to negotiate better deals. We'll be able to choose where we're going to publish. There'll be more competition between the publishers. That price is going to come down. So the reason why the subscription model enabled uh, Elsevier to print their own money is because there were no market forces preventing them from doing so. Um, whereas with this new model, all of those, um, that they'll be getting trouble from every side. And, and, and the whole game changes. So if you look at Porter's Five Forces, you'll be interested. But while we were having the conversation earlier, the, we were talking about Amelica and, and this and that, and, and someone said, what about Afrelica, I think they said. But the point is that w w the way we're moving, I think that the dog is going to start wagging the tail again, which is going to be fantastic. And here, here are the numbers. Um, so, and I've got about five minutes left if I'm, my stopwatch is anything to go by. So I'm nearly done. So bear with me. The, the first column is the overall numbers. And I'm just going to read out to you that, that at the moment, about 67% of whatever we publish has corresponding authors. And if we run the numbers that I've described already, it looks like at the moment our cost per article is 45,000 rand. So when someone tells you an APC of 2,000 euros is expensive, you're not realizing that you're paying more right now in the current system, which is crazy. And um, I think that we can make a saving of 25%. That's the takeaway of the first column. That's the overall it's back of a cigarette box guess of what, where we're going. But then I said, okay, let's look at Elsevier, let's look at Taylor Francis, Taylor Francis, Springer Nature, Wiley, and Sage. What if we did the same numbers and we just looked at our research output in those areas? Well, Elsevier, your current cost per article is closer to 95,000 Rand. <laughs> per article that we produce, we pay 95,000 Rand to Elsevier by paying for subscriptions and article processing charges. I'm estimating two key, two key estimations. One, that members pay about 20% more for journals outside of Sandlick. That's my one key estimate, based on one of the top research outputting institutions whose data I could analyze quickly. And number two is that there's possibly 14% more uh, research output that we cannot find in Scopus and Web of Science combined. So I'll use those assumptions in my numbers. And based on that, you know, and if we go the APC route and we assume an, a, an article processing charge of 34,000 Rand or 2,000 Euro, that, that would be flat across all of them. So Elsevier would go from 95,000 to 34,000. That's a saving of 65%. Uh, Taylor and Francis, we probably might pay a little bit more, depending on what the article processing charges end up being. Um, but when I say a bit more, it's like 0.29% more. It's almost even, right? Um, Springer Nature, 39%, Wiley, 66%, and Sage, 50%. So there, there are the numbers, folks. That's a compelling reason to change. Everybody can read everything and everybody can publish everywhere, and we save money. What more do we want? So just to let you know that we're in discussion with the following publishers about transformative deals, but I can't see any of them starting before January 2021 at the earliest. And I've got two minutes. Um, so we've got to unpack a whole lot of data before we go into those negotiations to make sure we get the right deal. Germany, the, the gentleman mentioned that, uh, from Plan S mentioned that Germany paid 2,750 euros per article. I know for a fact by talking to those folks that that's half of what they were currently paying. So they're, they're happy as Larry, but so is Wiley. <laughs> you know, so, um, so we've got to do the data analysis. Um, I don't think we need to worry about the um, small publishers, I was at the ICOLC Luxembourg conference where a lot of that came up. 
and here they're talking. So if you look up spa ups, the, these are the, the people who've been looking into how can we transform um, smaller journals. And one fantastic example, annual reviews. They can't really charge an article processing charge, so they can't really go to that model. What they've done is they've said, okay, if everybody who's currently paying a subscription continues to pay, we'll give you a 5% discount year after year, as long as you keep paying, and then we'll make it open for the whole world. That's, that's a fair deal, isn't it? I mean, if we were passionate about the same thing, and these guys are coming to the party, why not? Right? We've seen the scope model, you've seen that model. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of models out there. So if you want to find out more about that, you can just go to the Spa Ups project report. It's fantastic, and it'll show you that, that there are solutions even for the smaller publishers. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is a slide that Norway shared with us, where they're looking at where their money is currently flowing. And the three colors show what they do know is flowing, what they think is flowing, and what they have no idea about the money flowing. Because they know, don't know how much we're spending on what. Nobody knows really how much is being spent on APCs. So when you paid your APCs, you said a gentleman from overseas paid you for once, or you paid out of your pocket. Did any of that come through your institution so we can track it? Absolutely not. So we haven't a clue, unless we get secondary information from all over the place. So there are challenges. It's not simple. I'm not trying to make it sound like this is plain sailing. But what I'm saying is that it's doable, and we need to get the whole country, in, or the whole of the NSI, what's that, National System of Innovation. Thank you, sir. We need to get the whole National System of Innovation understanding this on the same page and behind it if we're going to save ourselves oodles of money. Um, so that's more or less what I've already said, and I, I cannot stress enough. We've got to find a way in each institution to communicate, 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 and get the finance guys behind the library, behind the, the faculty, speaking with one voice. And that's why I like dogs. Thank you very much for listening to me.